the first picture, which you unfortunately can't see, is a picture of the statue. I think that's where the story starts. Uh, I think everybody in Wigan is a, comes across the statue, uh, <laughs> and, and you'll see on the inscription uh, a man who uh, was a long-standing MP of Wigan, uh, whose statue was erected uh, from public description before he actually died, so he was actually uh, venerated before he died. And for most people, that's the story of Sir Francis Powell, and certainly was uh, from, from my point of view. And so I stumbled across the fact that in 1881, uh, he was involved in a corrupt election where his election was overturned. Uh, and it intrigued me that a man whose election was overturned in 1881 could then, from 1885 uh, to 1910, uh, serve as an MP for Wigan uh, with this, of this what appeared to be public um, celebration of his life. And it seems such an intriguing story that there must be, must be more to it. So what I was going to go through is um, his life uh, up to 1881, then put that into the sort of political and social background of the time, because I think context is important in, in this particular case. Uh, the events immediately leading up to the election, uh, the trial itself, and then what I would call the aftermath and the rehabilitation of Sir Francis Powell, then a little bit about the statue, and then talk about the legacy of Sir Francis Powell, and um, uh, just as discussion about the conclusions uh, that we might be able to draw from all this. And, and possibly, as, as Paul said, some parallels in, to, in today's society. So he was born on the 29th of June in 1827 at Bellingham Lodge. Now, Bellingham Lodge is actually um, where Bellingham Mount is, if, if people are aware of the, the geography of Wigan, right opposite the, the infirmary. Um, at the time he was born, obviously, Wigan and Fairview didn't exist. There was a row of cottages in front called Cinnamon Row, uh, but that's where he was born. Uh, and his father was the uh, Reverend Benjamin Powell, who was the vicar of St. George's, uh, which, as people know, is, is just off Powell Street. Clearly, it wasn't Powell Street at the time, but that's, that's where St. George's uh, church is. And his mother was Anne Way. Um, his father died in 1861, and then his mother died in 1873. The picture there would have been of St. George's. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting fact is, is Anne Wade, his mother. Um, his mo she was linked to the Sharp family of Horton in Bradford. And it was from her that he inherited, through her family, shall I say, he inherited the large Portman Estate uh, in Bradford uh, in 1844, and that's where a lot of his wealth actually came from. Also, he also got wealth from his father from the properties that his, and land that his father owned uh, around the Wigan area. But there is a link there with Bradford, which, which we, we hear about later on. In terms of his schooling, he went to Wigan Grammar School. Uh, then in 1842, at, at the age of uh, 16, he actually went to Uppingham School, a boarding school. And it's at that boarding school that he writes to his father and describes his time at um, Uppingham School. Uh, and interestingly, he actually writes to his father asking for permission to have a bath. So clearly, having a bath at school was a boarding school was an optional extra. You have to actually pay money to have a bath. So he writes to his father saying, I had a really good bath last week, can I have another one this week? <laughs> Only after two terms of studying at uh, Uppingham, he then goes to Sedbra College um, up, in the, up in the Lake District uh, at the age of 16, essentially for his sixth form. And uh, it's interesting to think, why, why did he go to Sedbra at that age? Why didn't he stay at Uppingham? Well, there was a very strong link between Sedbra School and St John's Cambridge. Uh, to, to John's College in Cambridge. So there were six scholarships solely for pupils from Sedba to go to St. John's College. And I, I, I do wonder whether it was almost like a tactical move to go to Sedba. When I contacted the archivist at uh, Sedba School, um, there was only about 90 kids in the whole school. So in his year, approximately, say, 15, 15 pupils. So there was a quite high chance of getting to Cambridge and, and know, in those odds. So he went to Cambridge and, and uh, studied uh, maths and, and classics. But just before the end of his time at Cambridge, he developed smallpox. 
Now, smallpox at that stage, well, always, is, is a, an extremely serious condition. Uh, he managed to survive it, but I think it may have had, just talking from a medical point of view, uh, I think it may have had issues for him later on in his life, and I'll, I'll explain that later on. He studied law at, uh, at London, and then it was called to the bar in, in 1853, and then moved back up north to what's called the Northern Circuit. His political career starts quite quickly. He actually stands for M to, to be an MP in Wigan, first of all, in 1852, so he's only 25 at the time, um, but lost, loses again in 1854, Lose, and then eventually does actually win in 1857, and that's the first time he becomes a, a Wigan MP, uh, but only, only lasts uh, two years. In the meantime, he marries Annie Gregson, who is from Liverpool, and, and she has political connections. Her, her uncle uh, is the MP for Lancaster, Samuel Gregson, so there's a lot of political uh, stuff going on in the background there. Um, he then decides to, having lost Wigan, he, he moves around. He starts doing this kind of, I'll try anywhere type approach. So he goes to Cambridge, um, and that is actually elected as MP in Cambridge, um, and then retains his seat again. But then he loses it. Then he stands with MP in Staley Bridge. So you get this impression of a guy that's really desperate to get into politics, and he's trying <laughs> all kinds of places. Uh, you know, God loves a try. He's, he's keep going, keep going for it. Excuse me, Richard. Yeah. Now, I'm not just the dates there, and certainly not every four or five years. Are these uh, by Yeah, they did be by elections, or yeah, so he would, he would hop onto a, presume, as, as happens now, you, if you see a, a seat becoming available, and you think, well, that, I'll go for that. Um, he then becomes an MP in 1872 for, for North West Riding, so he's going back to his kind of Yorkshire roots. Uh, but then he's very quickly defeated at Yorkshire. Um, but the guy doesn't give up, he, he keeps trying. Eventually, he, stand, he, get, he stands in Manchester, as an MP in Manchester. But there's quite a bit of hostility. Um, it, when he's having his campaign, there's, he has the, the, big, the big meetings at the Free Trade Hall and, and, and various other places around in Manchester. But actually, the, the arguments against him were firstly that why didn't he go, to, why is he trying Manchester? Why, why is he abandoning Wigan? Uh, the, the second uh, Thing was that there was allegations of bribery um, where he made two payments for £100 each to institutions in Manchester. Um, and the third thing was, that at the time, it, the whole Irish question was a very important, uh, important <coughs> question, uh, home rule for Ireland. Uh, he actually was showed an element of sympathy to it by saying that, that an inquiry should take place into home rule if the majority of Irish MPs wanted it to happen. So that actually became a negative for him in, in, in Manchester. Now, he, uh, the final point was he had a big interest in sanitation and um, public health, uh, but he was then criticised on the basis that the sanitation in some of his own properties weren't, weren't brilliant. Now, he denied all those, all those, um, all those elements, but anyway, he, he, he loses. But finally, he gets to Wigan, back, back to Wigan, back to his roots, and he wins the election in 1881, or he thought he had. So, before we go any further, just get into the sort of climate of what was happening at that time. So the 18th, 19th century, an awful lot of turmoil going on, increasing desire for greater representation of, of, of the, the normal people, away from the kind of establishment. So you have the American Revolution, you have the French Revolution, in 1798, you had the Irish Rebellion, and as a consequence of that, the Act of Union in 1881, where the Irish Parliament is disbanded, everything comes to, uh, to the UK, uh, to, to London. You then get the Peterloo Massacre in 1819, so increasing desire for one man, one vote, leading to 18 deaths uh, in the Peterloo Massacre. Then in 1829, the further social change when Catholic emancipation uh, came in, which meant for the first time ever, uh, the Catholics were able to hold uh, political positions or to have a, a more involvement in, in, public, in public life. There's a general 
feeling within the government at the time that they've got to do something. There's, there's, there's stuff brewing here. They've got to lance the boil. So they, the, the Reform Act comes in 1832. doesn't vastly increase the number of people voting, but it does start to organise things in a more organised way. Um, at, at that point, there was a big discrepancy between how different areas voted, and there was no representation, really, of the big industrial areas which were now developing because of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Does anybody know the, the, the word pot wallopers? Ever heard that phrase, pot wallopers? Yes. Pot wallopers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Now, we, we've used it in our house as somebody washing the dishes, the pot walloper, but it actually comes from the... from. In, in certain areas, you could vote if you had a, a heart and a pot. So they were called pot wallopers. So some bur boroughs, your vote depended on whether you were a pot, pot wallopers. <laughs> One thing the, the Great Reform Act did was actually, for the first time ever, it actually excluded women from voting. That was quite a surprise to most people. Before 1832, women could actually vote. But their voting depended on on their wealth and the, the, the land they owned. So if, it meant that very few women actually had the vote, but they actually did vote. So bizarrely, the Reform Act actually prevented women from voting. Then you have things like Tall Puddle Martyrs, which is the, the start of the, uh, the unions, um, the Chartist movement, which again was pushing for one man, one vote. Um, and then 1845 to 1849, although people vary on which, some people say it well, lasted longer than that, was the Great Irish Famine. And that obviously had implications for Wigan because there was a big influx uh, of an Irish immigrant community into, into Wigan, um, into, into the Scholes area, uh, which obviously had an impact on, on the, the population. And in fact, that's where my, my uh, great grandparents came to, to Wigan at, at that time. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room who probably have similar, you know, similar stories. The Second Reform Act, that just again increased the number of people voting. So back in 1832, uh, one in seven of the adult male population, women just don't count, <laughs> but one in seven of the adult male population were voting. By the time the Great Reform Act, the Second Act came in, it's down to one in three um, of adult men. The, sorry, the election in 1881 is in, in that, that time where democracy is, is, is still, in a sense, is still in its infancy. Although we think of democracy as, as being written you know, in stone, it actually it was continually developing. Um, and there was, in fact, more and more people were voting meant there was new challenges in terms of, of what was going on and how votes were sorted out, etc. So the election happened because of the death of the Earl of Crawford. So, with his death, his son, James Lindsay, he was a sitting MP at the time, and there were, there were two MPs in Wigan at the time, he went to the House of Lords, so the election set for the 18th of January, 1881. The background was, at the time, there was a Lancashire's miners' strike, which had started on the 1st of January, and had lasted for six, six weeks, starting before the election and after the election. And that had an impact in, in terms of how when the case comes, how that is actually judged. And the reason there was a strike was because of the thing called the Employment Liability Act. So up, up to that point, if there any miner had been injured in the, mine, in, in the mines, there was a, compens a voluntary compensation scheme. But it was, the contributions were 75% from the miners and, and just 25% from the mine owners. This act, which in fact, uh, Francis Powell actually supported was that the liability fell totally on the mine owners, that they were totally responsible for any injury of, of, of their employees. The mine owners then tried to make it that if you, if one of the miners no longer uh, took part in the voluntary scheme, they would be sacked. Because obviously, the, miners, the mine owners' point of view is they didn't want to have 100% the responsibility, they wanted these these voluntary schemes to, to remain, so at least they were, were paying all the compensation if, if an injury occurred. And there was also a demand for increase in, in, in wages. So you can imagine in, in Wigan at the time, there would be a large number of miners who would be, who would be struggling uh, financially um, at, that, at that time. The 
Interestingly, the Sydney MP at the time described that act as it would lead to nothing but carelessness and idleness amongst miners. It just seemed incredible that you could actually, you could actually say that. Um, as though they were going out there to get injured. Um, but, um, so he, he wins the election. There's about five to 6,000 people voted in the election, which is a, a quite astonishing turnout of 93%. Uh, you compare that to today's turnout, uh, with a majority of just over 600. All is well, but then the Liberals decide that things things were happening during the election, uh, which they weren't, yeah, weren't happy about, so they challenged the election. Um, the, the fact that is a trial is set for, for, for March, so a couple of months after the election, the trial starts. But this wasn't the first time this had happened. It's not an unusual event. Uh, there's a series of books written by a guy called O'Malley who chronicles all the petitions against elections uh, since the, you know, the format. And there's a, I think there's about six volumes of this. And each, 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 each volume has about 40 cases. So you, it's, not, it's not unusual. I mean, for us nowadays, it would be very unusual to have an election challenge for bribery. Uh, but in, in, that, in that period, when things were developing, it wasn't that unusual. And there'd already been... Um, four cases within Wigan uh, where the election had been challenged and there was an element of tit for tat it was either Liberals against Conservatives, Conservatives against Liberals etc in 1880 which was the general election there had been a threat of a petition against Lord Lindsay but then it was decided not to, not to pursue it so in that context we're not, we're not dealing with an unusual event um, so the, the trial starts with the arrival of the judges at uh, Wigan Northwestern, and it's all chronicled in the, the Wigan Observer, which Peter Fleet would very kindly send me the, the details. So they arrive at Northwestern Station, great fanfare, mayor, mayor meets them, big crowds, big events. So as, they, as the two judges are getting off the, off the train, off another carriage, Sir Francis Powell is getting off, along with Nathan Eckersley, who was the, the chairman of Eckersley's Mill, he was the chairman of the Conservative Party, so you've got the, the judges coming off on one, one, and then one carriage, and then the, the, the two other men coming off the other carriage. They then stay at a house called Bank House on Wigan Lane, just to, just to say what that is. That's between the Wigan Infirmary, the Elms, and the United Reform Church. So around Milton, Milton Grove, there's a, an area of land there. That's where uh, uh, Bank House was. It's actually, the trial itself happens at King Street um, in, the, in the borough offices in, in uh, King Street. And they've extensively rent, uh, altered the, the offices to make it into a sort of a, a courtroom. So the key players from the, from the Liberal side were Edward Prest and Jane Spence, who raised the petition, but they're both bankrupts. So it's not the candidate, John Lancaster, that raised it, it's apparently two bankrupts. Uh, and there's a reason for that, as we'll find later on. Their solicitor is a guy called John Wall, and the, sort of, and the barrister is a guy called Mr. Daly. These are characters we kind of learn about a little bit during the trial goes on and get a little bit of their personalities. Yeah. On, the, on the defence side is Nathan Eckersley, who was the chairman of the Conservative Party at the time, uh, and Thomas Scott, the secretary. And he played an important part because what they've got to prove is that what happened wasn't just a, a rogue individual. He was an agent for... Uh, uh, Francis Powell. So a lot of the case depends on, on this role of Thomas Scott. Was he a secretary? Was he an agent? The solicitors were Darlington and Sons, so Ralph Darlington, uh, and then their counsel was, was Mr. Matthews. The important thing to say is that in, pre the trial, Francis Powell is actually cleared. He's acquitted. On the basis that he had no direct involvement in the events uh, in Wigan. So the trial is not about Francis Powell. Um, the, the, the logic is that he, he delegated his um, election to the local, the local council, uh, Conservative Council, uh, T, uh, Conservative Association T. Um, and had, he, had, did, he did very little personal canvassing in, 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 in Wigan. So it's a question of looking at two ways. 
you know, delegation is another man's uh, turning a blind eye. It's a it's one of those kind of scenarios. But he, he was he was clear. He technically was not um, not found corrupt. So the allegations were that of bribery, 288 cases of bribery, uh, treating, which basically was providing food or, or ale, or, um, and that happened, these are, these are the allegations, uh, allegations that in, in occurring in uh, 228 times in 32 pubs or houses. Um, there's a few recognized pubs as you, as you in, in the story, like the Bowling Green, and, um, I think the packet, the packet in up in, in, in Welly. There's a few other other particular around skulls, um, and then uh, undue influence. Uh, the, uh, the the start of the, the trial gets off to a bad start because the the counsel um, for the Liberal Party, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Daly, obviously quite a laid back character. Uh, he books his train to arrive. The Southport train to arrive at Wigan at 10.29. Um, the, the, the case actually starts at half past 10. Um, and his train was late. <laughs> so <laughs> things don't change. The judge is, is, is starting to get annoyed and, and says, well, he, if he's not here, the solicitor, who was expected to be in the background, you can start the case. And you can imagine this poor guy thinking, what do I do now? But he then notices uh, Mrs. A just about just arriving just in time, so he's okay. Um, so the, the other character that get, then, then gets introduced is um, uh, Joseph Bellis. He's working for the Liberals, and his job ultimately is to find out which people have been treated and bring them uh, to, their, to their, their solicitor's team uh, to take the statements. But they were paid for those statements. They were paid out of two and a half shillings or two shillings for a statement for their expenses. Um, when they were asked why, why go from two and a half shillings to two shillings, they said, well, they ran out of sixpences <laughs> and we're not going to go up to three shillings. <laughs> so, so that was why that was the discrepancy. But as, as the case goes on, he gets some great, uh, great quotes. Uh, so this John Ainsco, he, he's asked about uh, following a guy into John G's house, and John G is the man who provides breakfast for quite a few of these people. So the conversation goes, so you followed him in? Yes. How long did you stop? Not so long. Is that an answer? Do you as a Lancastrian man think that is a sufficient answer? Okay, clearly keen to actually be really specific about um, what was happening. So the judge laid out four conditions to, to make it a, a case of bribery. They had to, the person had to be a voter, he had to have the breakfast, he had to be asked to vote, and he had, he had to actually have voted. So the whole, the whole thing then is between the, the two sides. One side proving, trying to prove that they were definitely voted and definitely had the breakfast. The other side saying, well, it's a minor strike. Uh, it's not unusual for, for people to be given breakfast under, under these circumstances. You know, Wigan's a social area. You know, people do pay for other people's drinks, etc. So that, that was sort of the general tenor of going backwards and you know, backwards and forwards. The other thing that comes up is obviously a lot of people couldn't actually read or write. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about whether people were directed and told to vote number two. And number two was the fact that he was number two on the, the ballot paper. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether people were told, if, whatever you do, just tick number two. Um, Okay. The, the judge obviously starts getting a bit sick of all these stories. At one point, one of the, the defendants, uh, one of the witnesses said, I had breakfast at John G's. And the judge says, I have no wish to know what you had. In fact, I'm getting tired of John G's breakfast. This is only day two of day nine of the trial, so you can see he's getting a bit, uh, a bit cheesed off. What is the potato pie, the judge asks. <laughs> that's, that's something he's, uh, he's never really come across before. <laughs> He said, what is the potato pie? Potatoes only, or potatoes and meat, like an Irish stew? So he, he's asking about it. And there's one point where he, he's, um, he's told that people walk into a pub and somebody buys, another table buys them two cans of beer to, to share amongst themselves. And he, and he says to this, that astonishes us from the South. Is that a common thing in Wigan? 
you see men you don't know, and then you ask you ask them to drink with you, and, and they treat you. So there's this whole thing about what what is normal behaviour in Wigan, and what is what is actually abnormal behaviour. What also comes across is that there's some of the things that happened in previous elections by, by the other side. This Thomas A. Acker is asked about a guy called Mr. Ashcroft who worked for Liberals. And he, he said to him, have you ever had beer from Mr. Ashcroft? Oh, we've had no beer from him since the last general election. And then he was swimming in it and dropping money down his channel of the legs. <laughs> and you picked it up, I suppose. I know a man that did. So he was a man flowing with beer and silver. Yes, plenty of money was spent at that election. This is the 1980 election. There was more need of a petition on the other side than, than there is now. So you get this whole impression of things you know, working both ways. <coughs> okay. Just a quick aside, on that same page of the paper, there was a little mention of the cost of the Afghan war in 1881, and lessons haven't been learned. The Afghan war at that stage had cost 19 million. Yeah. 540,000 and, and that's in, in, in that time I went on to there's a Bank of England thing where you can work out what it would have been in the, in the current day and we're talking we're talking billions um, and, we, and we think we're very clever we know, we know how to do things but talk about history repeating itself um, this is a very common common theme of, of um, people changing their story so what would happen is they would go and give their they'd be found by Mr. Bellis, give them a statement to say that they were treated. But when they came to be as witnesses, they would change their story and say, no, they never actually said that. Um, mm -hmm. And they're pushed on it. And essentially, one of the best answers given by one of the people, and he said, well, that was a statement. Now I'm under oath, so I've got to tell the truth. So, <laughs> so you, you see people playing the, system, playing the system, and you can't blame them if you're going to get paid for a statement. Well, why not do it? Just get paid for the statement and then come back and then I'll just deny it. So, so there's, there's a, this is uh, going on. And, and this Mr. Day is getting, it's quite a cool customer, the, the uh, barrister for the, um, uh, for the Liberal Party. But he, he's obviously starting to get a little bit cheesed off that this, these stories keep changing. And he comes up with a line which I think is probably the best line for a prosecuting barrister. When he's trying to get something to say, he definitely heard, heard them said to them, he said, do you think it's possible he said it without you being aware of it? <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think you're dragging the barrel, just keep the barrel there, try and get an answer there. Okay. Okay. Mr. Day again is obviously getting a little bit frustrated, trying to get people to name people. Um, he says to one, to John Eccleston, talking about people that may have also got treated a lot as uh, along with him. Can you give me the names of any of them? I should take it as a favour and a great personal convenience if you would try your memory. He's obviously getting, I want to nail this, this thing, and it's just not happening. That was a, a definite case of, of, of bribery. A guy giving 10 shillings. Um, but then he tries to, he then tries to double cross on it. He actually is a, a liberal. He's given the 10 shillings. He immediately then reports that to the uh, to the Liberal uh, team. Uh, but there was a definite he was, where he was giving 10 shillings. To put that in context, um, a miner at that time was probably getting, say, five to six shillings a day for his work. So it's a, it's a, a reasonable payout. And again, if, if, you're, if you're on strike and you've got no getting money in, then, you know, why not take the money? John Kelly was another guy who, um, giving evidence, um, he was approached by the by um, the Conservative Association to see about his voting, and he makes the point that you're still not paying me for the last election. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what happens after he has that statement? He gets a coal delivery, an, un, an unannounced coal delivery arrives at his house. Um, he's not actually billed for it until just after the petition is raised to, for the for the election to be challenged. Now the the prosecution point, they said, this is, a, this is clear evidence that they've, they've now tried to cover their tracks by presenting him with a bill. Um, but the, on the defence side, they said, well, that's normal practice. We need it a month before we bill somebody. So who knows? Who knows? But anyway, he gets, he never actually ordered the call. Uh, the prosecution, that's right, the defence also suggested that he just got delivered to the wrong house. Um, but anyway, you can read it, don't what you want. Okay. Another clear place. Uh, 
case of bribery was the six workers from the Winston Colliery um, who were all given, t given 10 shillings uh, to vote. They were given it on the basis that they were, they were paid for uh, their, their train journey uh, there and back and, and yeah, their missed work. But, but even if you had all that together, it still wouldn't have been 10 shillings. So um, there the, the, the really, the were clear evidence where, where, where bribery had taken place. Yeah, never quite found out who Noggy is. But <laughs> <laughs> Any of these, any of your relatives? <laughs> okay. So going back to the beginning, why were Preston and Spencer both, two, both bankrupt? Why were they chosen? Well, the simple answer was, that if costs were awarded against them, if they lost the case, they couldn't get money off them. If, if, John, um, if John Lancaster, the Liberal um, MP, who got the Liberal uh, candidate, he would have had to pay the full, full cost because he would have had in, enough uh, funds to, to pay the full cost. But by choosing bankrupts, they'd actually chosen two people who couldn't, who couldn't pay the cost if it was. So there was a little bit of, uh, and that's something the judge, the judge actually pick up on um, in, in the final statement. Um, so the closing defence, and it's usual what you'd expect, defending of Powell's character, and, um, <coughs> and he was the part in the people's, people's choice. Um, John Lancaster assumed he'd win because he thought he would have the miners were on strike. He thought he would have their support, um, but on the, the countryside, he actually pledged for home rule. So um, it was possibly again some some loss of vote in, in, in other areas. But what does come across is the the, the fact that St. Scold was seen as a as a difficult area, and, and the, what, what the prosecution tried to say was that actually it wasn't as bad as people were making out. Whereas the defence side was saying actually it was really bad, and we had to send lots of people in there because of, because it was so bad. Um, but there, there was a um, sorry, uh, there's one description of um, of, of skulls given by um, by the defence. They said in terms of what was happening in skulls. They sallied forth with picks and cudgels and frying pans and broken spades and other weapons and faces and hands were cut open. No responsible person of the Blue Party would have dared to go into skulls without considerable risk of being molested, snowballed, stopped, interfered with or insulted. my <laughs> 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 So, so that's, that's why they justified having two or three rooms around Wigan in, in most areas where they, where they, they, they entertained the, the workers, whereas in Skull they had 16 to 18 different rooms, and also a large number of special constables as well. So it's, it's time to come towards the end, and the judge makes the point, look, we can carry on, we can keep on calling witnesses, but as far as I'm concerned, I've heard enough. There's enough evidence here to stop the trial now. Um, he, he said, you can carry on if you want, but your costs are just going to, just going to rack up. Um, he said, he made the point, this is a trial, it's not an inquiry. Um, as far as he's concerned, there's clear evidence of bribery, uh, and he's convinced that this Thomas Scott is, is an agent of, of uh, the Conservative Association. He's not just a, you know, a rogue player. He, he, he's written pamphlets on how to vote, he signed his name on it, he signed his name along with Nathan Eckersley as though they're, they're kind of co-partners, co he's not just somebody recording things, he is, he is actually an active part. Um, having said all that, he's, the judge is annoyed about the, the liberal tactics of, of having two bankrupts being the, the, the kind of chief, um, the chief petitioner as we were. So he does award costs um, against um, the, the defence team, but he, he limits it to 2,000. So they will only pay the cost of um, of the prosecution up to up to 2,000. So there is an element of being of being <coughs> recognising that, that that wasn't really um, But what the judge says, does say is that it's he actually says in the statement it, it, Wigan's not that bad, but he still thinks. That that the whole thing should be looked at by uh, a special electoral commission. 
as he felt the corrupt practice did extensively prevail over the election. But actually, if you read his statement, what you're saying is, look, we could have gone on a bit further to make some more inquiries, but it wasn't at the time, but perhaps, perhaps inquiries should be made uh, further down the line. So on April the 5th, the result is declared null and void. So um, he, he's no longer the MP. Francis Powell is no longer the MP. And in August, there's a vote um, in the House of Commons about whether there should be an inquiry. Now, interestingly, in all other cases, if a judge has said there should be an inquiry, the House of Commons has, has automatically accepted that. But in this case, they decide, it's, and it's a Liberal government, uh, it's decided that there shouldn't be an inquiry into, into Wigan. That there, there are a lot worse cases than, than occurred in Wigan. Um, at the time, Knowles, who was the MP for Wigan, was too ill to attend that debate, but uh, a local MP from, from, from Bolton called J.K. J. Cross spoke in favour of, of, of not having a commission in Wigan. And he has a, one of the, the best descriptions I've ever heard of, of, of Wigan people. You ready for it? <laughs> <laughs> the people are rough and ready, and a great many of them are colliers, who are certainly a dog-running, pigeon-flying, cock-fighting, <laughs> Church and King lot will always vote Tory, but they are not corrupt. And I'm certain if they were to go to Wigan and offer to bribe 20% of that town, you would have the money thrown back in your face. So there you are. So there's somebody standing up for Wigan. It's good to hear. <laughs> okay, so we're in a bit of a limbo now. So there's no commission, but there's no MP either. So it goes to back to the House of Commons to issue a writ for the next throw and the by-election. But there, there's a bit of a bit of sour grapes, and people say, "Well, hang on a minute, it, it was pretty bad. It's too late to let them have another another election." So it, it's actually it's lost. But eventually, in, in, in November, they get a writ, writ for elections issued, and on, in December, so about a year later, uh, there's an election win. And in fact, the Conservatives win, not not Powell, but the Conservatives do actually win, so they retain the seat. So Francis Powell, despite everything that's happened, comes back to Wigan, and, and he wins with actually an increased majority than he had back in 1881. So in a sense, he's forgiven. He's forgiven by the electorate, and that's probably an important point to make. For those people who could vote, he was forgiven. That's not necessarily the same thing as he was forgiven by the whole population of Wigan. Um, again, a massive turnout of 91%. Okay. He then goes on to win, continues to win, right through to 1906, with a, that's the share of his vote, which is always pretty, pretty consistent. It's a three-man vote in 1906, that's the, the emergence of the Independent Labour Party. So just before the Labour Party itself is, 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 is brought in. So the, in, there's an independent Labour candidate, so that's the first time that is a three-way contest. And again, the turnouts are, are incredibly impressive, I think, compared to you know, today's standards. Still in the high 80s, 90s. It's his final election is in 1906, and you can see, again, high turnout. This is the figure for 2019, just to give you a comparison. Two things to, to notice. One is the, the change in the electoral numbers. So you've gone from 8,000 to 75,000. So that's the, the continuing increase in the, the, the number of people voting. Um, but then the turnout. Um, you, you're going down from 87 to, 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 to just two, you know, two thirds. Um, if you look at local council elections, we're, we're talking 30%. Um, So what, what were Powell's politics? He was very much a Church of England man. That was his big thing, um, and education. He was a strong believer in education, um, and was very strongly supported the idea of, of um, universal primary school education. So from that point of view, he's quite he's quite a liberal a liberal politician, and he actually supported liberal um, the liberal government on issues in relation to um, uh, education. In fact, he linked the two together. Um, he said, education I have declared on many occasions is imperfect unless a citizen is taught duty towards God, 
as well as fear of the magistrates. And I know, I know not how duty towards God can be incalculated in a better manner than by the reading and the teaching of Holy Scripture in our schools on every day of the week. So he, he feels education important, but he feels it should be um, within a, in a religious religious setting. He's a very strong uh, um, believer in, in faith schools. Um, in terms of sanitation and public health, he had a great interest in, in public health issues um, and a uh, great interest in particularly in sanitation um, and was heavily involved at a, at a both, you know, political level and, and locally in, in terms of that. Um, he's very, also very um, strong on um, things like the employment liability that we talked about. He was also pushed for um, the, the age in which uh, Kids could go down the mines from eight to, to thirteen. So you can see there's a there's, here's actually a very kind of liberal social type of um, 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 MP, and he's not frightened to go against his, his own his own party at times. He was very busy in Parliament. He was um, on seventy two committees um, during his time in Parliament, and he was chairman of, of two committees. For, for 10 years that he was in uh, an MP, he, he was in government, he was part of government. But he never had, as far as I can see, he never had any ministerial office. I'm not quite sure where that's, whether there was some tainting back from 1881, or whether um, he just, he wasn't particularly bothered about that, he just wanted to get other things, other things done. In terms of schools, he, he was heavily involved in Wigan Grammar Schools. Um, Supporting Wigan Grammar School, both as a trustee and as a governor. He, he set up scholarships at Wigan Grammar School, very heavily involved in Centre School, his old school. He was chairman of governor there for a long time and, and, and gave money to the school. And, and there's buildings now uh, at the school dedicated to him. Uh, he helped develop St George's School. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's Again, this shows his kind of social, what you might call it, social conscience. I shall eagerly embrace every opportunity of just promoting the happiness of all classes. And on trade unions, he said, workers should be fully entitled to combine for their own protection. So again, he's, he's, he's promoting uh, workers' rights. Um, just, just going back to Education. The other thing he was heavily involved in was obviously the the, wine, uh, the, the Wigan Miners, uh, Wigan and Lee Miners Mining College, so I'd say. Um, and he was part of the, the team with, with Hewlett that uh, had the idea of developing the college, um, which started off as a as a a way of celebrating the Queen Victoria Diamond Jubilee. Um, the whole cost of it was about fifty thousand, and he donated two and a half thousand. Um, towards it, which was a you know, significant sum of money. But by the time 1910 comes along, he's getting an older man, he's, he's quite profoundly deaf, um, and he decides that's enough is enough, so he, he doesn't contest the 19, uh, 1910 election. In terms of the statue, the actual idea of the statue started back in 1907, which, if you can remember, was the 50th anniversary of him first becoming MP in Wigan in 1857. Um, and a committee set up by um, Mayor Donoghue, who was actually a liberal. Um, so, so again, it's this feeling of it, it's a cross-party thing. It's not a, it's not, it's not just the Tory party uh, celebrating their own. Um, and the idea of the actual statue comes from a guy called R.C. Berlin. He was a chemical engineer in, in, in Wigan, um, and it was designed by a guy called. There was a competition. And the, uh, the eventual winner was a guy called E.C. Gillick, who'd done quite a few uh, big um, public statues, including the Cenotaph in, in, in Glasgow. Um, a lot of the money was raised at the very first meeting. So what I haven't found out is how much, how, how much money was raised outside that meeting. So when, you, when we talk about public subscription, I'm not entirely sure how, how public, public the, that's what I mean, the subscription, subscription was. Anyway, it was done. Um, the wording on it is quite simple, and it was actually done by himself. Um, so the wording is, as you, as you, you all know, it just simply says but when, when he was MP for, for Wigan. There's no sort of glorification or, or you know, I'm a wonderful man type stuff. Um, 
The other thing that I'm not sure, and it's a shame you can't see it, but the, the people are aware that there's two sort of frescoes on either side of the, the statue. If, you have, if you're not aware of it, it's worth having a look at them. Uh, but Mikhail, I nearly killed myself because they're, they're so slippy uh, at the moment, so well, I almost went A over two with it. But anyway, there's, there's, two, there's two frescoes. One is based on health, and one is based on education, which again indicates what his, his, his main interests were. That is the, the health one, because there's, there's, there's young, young kids there, and it looks like somebody is helping them. It's, it's, it's described in, in, in the book about them, that it's, it's based on, on health. And I, I think I interpret that as somebody is, is caring for those, for those kids. <laughs> so the unveiling was done by Lord Derby, or, or Edward Stanley, in, in 1910. Now, people who know the liberal history, Stanley Park, that's the, the Derby's. But if anybody's uh, aware of... Um, I talk in Canada, there's a, a Stanley Cup. What I didn't realise was that his father was the uh, ambassador to, well, sorry, uh, to, to Canada. Uh, and he, he was interested in, in ice hockey, so he actually produced a trophy with the Stanley, the Stanley Cup in, uh, in Canada. So, you know, that's a bit of a little aside. Um, so, like all these things, I think. It's interesting to get the facts down and then have a, then you can back start thinking of opinions. I think too often at the moment we start off with having the opinion and then make a fact uh, to fit that opinion. So, um, was he an ambitious politician? I think he was. Um, and, but I think there's a, it's, it's funny how you don't, when you're doing these things, you kind of either warm somebody or you, you kind of start, you know, you don't warm them. As the story goes on, I, I think he was an ambitious politician, but, but not necessarily for himself. I think he was an ambitious politician who actually did, you know, did do things and was possibly ambitious for his, his, own, his own community. Was he a corrupt politician? Well, unfortunately, I think he, he was tainted by corruption. I don't, I don't think you can, you can um, say otherwise, but, but I don't think that necessarily... Um, should negate from the, 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 good, the good stuff that he, he did. Was he an effective politician? Well, he would say he was. He, the, the death rate uh, while he was a politician had, had halved in, in, in Wigan, um, partly because of better sanitation. It's also, what I haven't mentioned, was his drive to improve housing in, in, in Wigan. Um, what lessons to learn from it? Well, I think one of the things that, that struck me is, and, and, it's important of engagement in politics. Um, what you see from the, the, the turnout is how, how the turnout is gradually falling. Um, we can criticise our politicians uphill down Dale. The bottom line is they are accountable. We can always throw them out at the end of a, end of a, a term of office. But we can only do that if you actually engage in, in, in the process. So if you get to the stage now, and the other thing is purely just looking at what's happened in terms of the sacrifices that people have made. So you think of those 18 people that, that were killed in Peterloo, which is not, not a million miles away from here. I think they would be turning in their grave if they thought people were, 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 were so apathetic that they didn't actually go and, go and vote. And I, I'm, I'm as guilty as them. Um, I'm not, um, I think sometimes we should, shouldn't stay, take, take a state back. It's very easy to say, what point, what's the point of the vote won't count? Well, your vote won't count if you don't vote. Um, and if you look at the local council elections, you can get people vote on the council who only had one in ten of that, of the, of that voting population actually voted for them. Um, and the other lesson, I think, is, is democracy is fragile. You know, we are... It's not, as I said at the beginning, it's not written in stone. It's something that does need to be nurtured. And I think the events of, of January the 6th in America show how fragile it can be. Um, and it's not something we should take, you know, should take for granted. The danger is not necessarily from extremists, but possibly because other people don't get involved and, and allow the room for extremists then to, you know, to, to come in. Um, so, so Francis Powell.